idea that comes to mind and um, and, and it comes to mind because uh, I guess like corp, uh, corporate report mentioned sedition for, seditions version sabotage um, today. They put out a solutions watch video on simple sabotage, and I'm not going inc- to implicate I anybody here. But if uh, but I guess another possibility I know like I, and I know like I, I know you've thought about this before at least. But um, you could also use guerrilla gardening as a simple sabotage ta- ta- uh, you know tactic or technique, right? You want could you, you I guess just give give the listeners some ideas if you could. Uh. Okay, so hypothetically speaking. Of course, yeah, of course, hypothetically speaking. If one if one knew of a location where, say, let's, uh, you know, a police station or let's say a impound yard for the drug task force of your local area or, you know, a uh, munition, a weapons factory that makes uh, weapons for the government, you could certainly start planting things that would... Uh, at the very least, irritate or destroy or slow slow them down. So I'm thinking of things like invasive vines or poison ivy, or if you have a um, or marijuana in the lo- in the flower pot at the local police station, or um, blackberries along the fence line of a uh, drug task force impound lot. Or, um, you know, there's a there's a SWAT vehicle, and you know where I live. The next town over has a SWAT vehicle. It's re- absolutely re- like a MRAP. And <laughs> so they've got it in this little yard, and right above them, you know, right up behind them is the railroad tracks. That's like up above their th- um, thing. So you could be walking along the railroad tracks and just start throwing seeds over the fence into this lot and they could have a field of pot growing in there or whatever you wanted to do to just piss these people off um you know kudzu or or bitter or some kind of vine that's just bamboo and yeah that's that's, that's what came to mind to for me and base and base really bamboo to, to where like uh, that'd be like 10 years down the road like you're you'd be you'd be fucking up their foundation like that's some hardcore like that's some hardcore stuff down the road yep yeah this is a, the other half of this uh that i really enjoy is because you I like trickster, prankster kind of stuff. That's my kind of my jam. So, like, just little things like that, you can really have fun. Number one, it's a fun hobby. But number two, you can really just, like, in small little ways, just stick it to the man, you know? And just fuck with them just a little bit. Just just enough to, like, if one person at, let's say, somebody planted blackberries along the drug task force um, impound yard, if one and they grew through the fence if one person one of them fucking pigs gets their arm scratched i'm a happy man you know what i mean like it's just that little dig you know what i mean <laughs> so but i mean picture a lockheed Mar- Mar- martin factory you know you could start planting like you said bamboo or fucking grapevines stuff that's really hard to get rid of and it starts screwing with their factory they're paying tons of money to try to get rid of this stuff um you know plant it all along their fence or you know what if you don't, you know, plant flowers, plant flowers all along the fence at, you know, just like wildflowers, just to kind of make a statement to like make something beautiful out of something so horrid. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, there you go. So, um, and then it's also feeding the bees and you know what I mean? And also you're kind of making a statement and they're, they go out and they're like, why the fuck is there flowers all around? Like, it's just a weird thing. Kind of weirds them out a little bit. You know, I, I like screwing with their heads a little um, but in terms of like destroying machinery and stuff, that kind of sabotage, eh, it'd be a little harder to do with plants. But you could definitely do some minor damage to these places just with plants, for sure. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Sec Realm Network, this parallel society that is already under construction, uh, just visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com. You should also check out Liberty Type Publications, and uh, more specifically, the second edition of my book, which was released on September 11th. Uh, it features a new foreword by Ben Stone, an introduction and update by yours truly. And a number of new chapters touching on the topics of crypto anarchy, uh, Bitcoin, uh, perpetual traveling possibilities, uh, among other things. Uh, so just visit libertyanattack.com forward slash Fawny Book. Uh, again, libertyanattack.com forward slash Fawny Book uh, to order now. 
Uh, today, I welcome back a friend and colleague, uh, Sek Magora from the Agora Podcast. Uh, you heard from him on this uh, on this podcast feed recently, and uh, the Food is a Weapon panel they hosted, a discussion which I was pleased to be a part of. Uh, so please make sure to check that out uh, if you haven't already. Um, he's uh, here to chat about a variety of topics. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, gathering he hosted at his Pazstead uh, pre Uh We'll talk about his com- his composting and uh, rainwater collection setups, and uh, maybe give you guys some new, uh, some new ideas because I know I was inspired after seeing what he's got going on. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the Gorilla Guarding project he's helping to coordinate, and uh, then we'll close off with a less solutions-oriented discussion. Uh, not sure where we'll, where we'll go exactly, but uh, from what we just talked about a few minutes ago, and I guess from what's uh, yeah, I guess from what's I guess transpired, um, yeah, and I guess uh, my interview with Corey Hughes, I guess let's put it that way. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot. Of, I guess we focused around Carrie Thorne, the JFK assassination, and then I'll bring up Bill Cooper too because uh, I guess Bill Cooper was. Uh, Bill Cooper and Corey Hughes came to a similar conclu- uh, conclusion, so that's uh, interesting to note. Um, but yeah, anyway, Sek, uh, welcome back to the uh, Vonnie Podcast, brother. Uh, how are things going? Doing well, man. Uh, thanks for having me back. It's been a while. Um, how's things? Uh, yeah, it has been a little while. Yeah, it has been a little while, but uh, things are good. Things are good. Um, I guess uh, kind of settling up for the winter, uh, which will be good. There's a, yeah, a lot of winter projects that need to get done, and... Uh, um, but yeah, I guess what's what's uh, what's new with you? I guess what's what's new on your end? Um, uh, what's well, I guess what what's uh, what is uh, what entails? Uh, or what's in, what's uh, and what's in the works for you for you know prepping for winter down in Tennessee? I don't even really know um, what the weather would be like down there. Oh man, you, you know how it is. Uh, the 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 list just never ends. You know what I mean? So <laughs> you're, when you're uh, working on a homestead, it's you know for every one thing you get done and take off the list, it, you know you add two more. Mm-hmm. But um, Coming up in the winter, you know, I'm, I'm uh, processing compost, um, getting the, the bins sort of reset. Um, we pulled all the weeds out of all the gardens, and we laid those out to dry and then laid them down at tax as a first layer of mulch. And then uh, we'll, we'll do a thick layer of wood chips over those. Um, I'm getting stuff cut back. Uh, a lot of my blackberry bushes, I'm cutting those back. Um, I'm doing some, um, propagating from, from plant cutting. So I'm experimenting with that a little bit. Um, let's see, I have a number of container garden, uh, containers, um, that I, I grow things in. And so I'm, um, cycling that soil out so dumping that back into the compost so it can regenerate the soil um i don't know man i this uh winter i plan to extend my chicken run into um what some people call a a uh, victory garden so i'm going to build two sides off of my chicken run and then um you close off one side and you plant there and then you allow the chickens to scratch and fertilize the soil on the other side and then you just sort of rotate back and forth Hmm. um so i plan to once i get a a some other things done that's going to be my next project um but in tennessee the uh, winters are pretty mild we we still grow plants pretty much throughout the the winter like you know spinach and kale and broccoli and that kind of thing Hmm. um so we'll be doing that, but it's just getting everything prepped for next year. Um, I will probably extend or expand uh, my gardens a bit, um, at least at least one of them. And um, I don't know, man. Um, yeah, that's the, that brings me probably right into spring, and then I'll be <laughs> <laughs> prepping everything and um, planting again and start all over. You know, yep. I don't know. Yep, back at it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I guess the the most pressing thing, and this will probably this might be a dab's giving activity, um, but uh, uh, we've got about I guess probably a dozen birds to process. Um, uh, I guess me, I don't know, half dozen ducks and maybe half dozen turkeys and or half dozen chickens and maybe a turkey. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not, I haven't really decided yet on that, but um, that's really I guess the 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 big pressing things. I know we've got a, a number of rabbits we can we uh, we could process whenever too. Um, so that that'll probably get done and. Uh, then yeah, I suppose uh, this this early, this spring we, um, as I think I talked about on the podcast a number of times, the big thing was getting getting the birds all set up. Um, so yeah, the birds were last year, and next year it'll be getting the ruminants set up, and um, yeah, I guess <clears throat> thinning out the herd a little bit, and then starting out, I'm going for quality over quantity because um, it got a little out of control 
um, r- uh, ruminants. They kind of, I guess they kind of, uh, you know, they kind of bang like rabbits, I guess you could say. Um, they're pretty, yeah, they're pretty fertile, fertile animals. So I've got a lot of control this year. So I'd, I'd pull that back a touch. Yeah, you can only do so much, right? Yeah. Um, you now you have a fierce winter up there, don't don't you have to? Um, do, what do you have to do for winter? You got to insulate any anything or? Um, so I guess uh, um, the like, uh, and um, so not not ne- it's so it's really only bad. Um, I've I've commented before. I guess in the past couple of years, I've only been here a few years. Um, in the winters, but um, the last couple of years, like I remember, I was out um like in you know mid December. Um, and with the sun out in the middle of the day, it feels like it's 50 or 60. Um, and it's, it's really only cold, like, uh, maybe like for a month or two, January and February, and we really don't get that much snow. Um, it's more so like, it'll get like, it'll get up to like 35 during the day and then it'll rain a shit ton and then it'll like flash freeze down to like 10 and then we'll just have like six inches of ice. So that's really, we don't, we don't really deal with, I guess, like the much colder snow other than a couple of months. But, um, I, yeah, I've had one for, um, once I had one pipe freeze, um, but there's not really much, much I can do about that. Um, but uh, yeah, that that you know that 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 happened once, but otherwise really hasn't have, really haven't had any issues. That might have just been a wear and tear thing too, because this house is old as shit. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, not not too much here. It's a, not yeah, we we can't grow year round um, like like in Tennessee, but it's 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 actually pretty surprisingly mild compared to even just a couple hours north where I used to live when I was going to high level indoctrination. So um, yeah, not not uh, not not too much. Obviously, put like put put straw in the in the ruminant coop, and we'll. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, make sure the the birds have you know a nice spot out of the wind and some straw. And um, I mean, we, we we focus primarily on ducks and turkeys. So um, the the cold so our ducks too, like the the khaki campbells and Indian runners, they'll lay um, not every day during the during the winter, obviously, but they'll lay year round. Um, and they're du- and they're you know ducks, so they can they can handle the cold. So um, yeah, really not too much, right. not too much surprisingly. But um, yeah, that I, I was surprising. <clears throat> I thought you'd have a harsher winter, but I guess you're for you know far enough south that it's not too bad that's yeah that's good yeah it definitely helps it definitely that would add another um another complication um i guess per se or just something else to adjust to um not necessarily a complication but um yeah i guess um that's that all uh, that all sounds good and i i i suppose i can can go ahead and get to because it'll bring us to you you kind of already talked a little bit about it but um we uh get to uh, get to talking about uh your gathering before um i guess before uh, yeah, before Bonnie Fest, the weekend before, you had a little gathering at your place. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I guess uh, your first experience, uh, you know, hosting. I'd, I guess hosting as a second home coordinator per se. Yeah, uh, it was the first annual meeting of the Royal Order of the Chiluminati. <laughs> I hosted it at my place uh, in the free territory of Sekistan, of which I am God Emperor. Um, we don't do republics around here. Um, it's uh, strictly a absolute monarchy, but I'm a benevolent dictator. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I hosted, uh, I had a, you know, a dozen or so people or 10, I don't remember how many people there were uh, here. They, they camped for uh, three, four days. Um, people that I, I knew or um, mostly. And then I had a couple of people from the uh, my local freedom cell come up for the day and it was a good time. We cooked out on the fire. We camped out in the um, the back field, and um, we traded some. There's a lot of trading going on, at least uh, that one day. And mm-hmm. um, I think everybody had a good time. I met a couple of new people. Um, well, I met a number of people I haven't met before, but um, it was uh, all all around a good time. And um, it was uh, it was uh, something else. You know, it's a lot. You know, having you know, hosting at your house is kind of uh, kind of like work. You know, you got a lot of people there, and you're trying to coordinate everything and and keep mm-hmm. wood stocked and the fire going and food going and everything. While you know, running around after my kids and stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, I took a day off after that to rest. We'll just say that. Well deserved. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But it was it was fun. Um, it was good meeting you and uh, mm-hmm. your other half and um, a couple of people that we, we've met a, a few other times up from Florida. And um, yeah, it was good. Came from all around. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, what, what did you think of it? 
you know, man, man it was um, it was great. It was great because um, I think I mentioned in the, in the in the podcast, or maybe it's just talking to you privately or whatever. But um, I mean, it was it was really cool to to meet with to meet up with I guess another you know network another network because I I mean there's obviously a decent um, community that I'm familiar with here around you know Michigan and Central Illinois that or I guess nor- Northern Illinois that type of area. So um, it was just completely different new group of people and um, um, yeah, it was a, a great a great experience for that. Um, you know, for the community and the networking, and then also just yeah, um, getting to see uh, see what you've got going on there. Um, and I guess just just speaking for me personally, it was um, I guess it was kind of my my uh, my uh, month in the in the second realm, I guess you could say, because I, I I had um had your thing the weekend before Vani Fest. Right, I guess yeah, but yeah, your your we or yeah, yours the weekend before Vani Fest, and then we pretty much had people here continuously. Um, up until like nine or ten, like maybe in like two weeks ago or less than two weeks ago. So, um, it was, yeah, it, it's, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. And then people will be back here, you know, for, for Thanksgiving or for uh, dad's giving. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always, it's always fun. Always great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, but yeah, I, I'm, yeah, you I'm must have been worn out too. Cause you had to, you had to drive all the way back and then host at your place for, you know, another couple of weeks after that. So you must've been tired too. I got to believe, but. Well, not as tired as I probably thought, as I thought I would have been or should have been. Um, but I mean, the, like there were, there were people here that came just specifically to help us with the events. Like there were like, I, I mean, that was, that was major help. I wasn't expecting like all, all the stuff to get done that did. Um, so that was, you know, um, obviously, obviously oh, nice. huge. Um, had, I mean, yeah, people were just, you know, picking up projects. Um, a lot of, a lot of wood cutting was done, you know, clearing of, uh, of trails and, um, a tree was cut out of the passing and sea that fell down a couple of few months ago, however long it was. And, uh, yeah, just lot, lots of stuff, lots of uh, lots of great projects and such. So, um, and yeah, good good times. So it was a full week. Yeah, obviously, Vani Fest is a full week, but um, yeah, I mean, as as far as like people being here, it was probably it was yeah probably a week and a half, a week and a half or or close to two weeks. Um, but yeah, it's I don't know. That's that's what that's what passing is here for. So, um, yeah, that's nice. It's good to get all that done. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess should have put more people to work. <laughs> maybe maybe you should have. Yeah, um, <laughs> but. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so I guess on that note, um, one thing I was really impressed by, um, cause you know, I've, I've had these, you know, these ideas, but I hadn't, I had never like really actually looked into it, looked into anything myself, like on, on ideas for projects, but, um, you've got a pretty, a pretty great composting setup, or I guess you have composting setup there, a worm composting setup and just, I guess, um, normal composting. And then, um, then there's a rainwater collection setup. So I guess, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what you got going on there and, and kind of the reasonings for it and, um, yeah, what you, what you like about it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, honestly, I just like playing in the dirt. Um, you know, I'm a, uh, I own a landscaping business by trade. And so I like dealing with plants and dirt and soil. And, um, so it's just, a, a been a passion of mine for a long time. Um, but coupled with that is I like taking, um, my waste streams and turning them into something productive so um you know most of our any kind of vegetable matter and um that sort of thing goes right into our compost bins or our worm bins and my compost bins i have um well i have four set up in series um and going from left to right i i have finished screen compost on on when um on one end and that would be uh the finished product and then um the second bin from the left i i have um sort of finer compost and that would be where i put sort of soft vegetable material um and the stuff that is already pre-rotted from the uh two further bins from the right um and then the other two i put <clears throat> sort of woodier material in different uh phases of decomposition um so that's where you put your like the stalks of your vegetable plants and um i also throw like if i end up with some extra shitty dirt from digging a hole around my property or something i'll throw it in there too um you know, stuff that's big, bulky, and woody that is hard to work and um, takes a while to break down. And then so I add that a little bit at a time as it breaks down um, to the other two bins. And then 
once I get towards the end, I screen, <clears throat> I screen it with a uh, what they call hardware cloth that I built a frame out of uh, around around the hardware cloth from 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 lumber that I scavenged somewhere, and uh, I sift it, and then all the the larger material goes back into my um, compost bin, and the 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 fresh screen finished stuff that usually uh, excuse me. <clears throat> I usually use that to um, directly to plant actually. Um, so like um, when I'm in the garden and you're digging a row to plant your seeds, I dig my row and then I just cover it in that. And that adds to my garden and also fertilizes mm -hmm. my seeds. Oh, and the second bin um, of the almost finished stuff, the, the, um, the pre-screen stuff, that's where I add my worm castings from my worm bins as well so um the reason i do that is because it's very hard to process when it's fresh because it's so wet so i just put it in there and kind of let it dry and let it mix in with that compost and then i sift it all through the through the screen um, this is not the most economical way to do this so if you're worried about uh, sort of uh, in terms of labor hours, of what I value my labor hours at, um, I could probably, it would probably be cheaper for me to just buy, if that makes sense. So it's not the most um, economical, but um, I, it's also, it's technically free because I'm doing it for free from my waste. But if you factor in labor, you know, it, it takes a lot of, it takes time for not a lot of product. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm getting rid of, you know, I'm using all of, you know, the vegetable scraps and eggshells and, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the veggies that, um, um, you know, got a hole or got partially rotten. Some of those I'll feed to the chickens or some of them I'll feed to the worms. Some of them I'll just throw directly in the uh, compost bin. So I'm using like uh, I'm using all of my waste, which is kind of important to me for sort of ecological reasons. And also there may come a time when I can't just go buy soil. Right. So I already have the system in place and the ability to do it where essentially I can create I, I can create a closed system if necessary. It's pretty darn closed system, although I do have some inputs. Um but I, I, if I need, if need be, I can, um, I can close the system off and be pretty much self-sustaining, um, at least in terms of my produce. So um, that's that's my the, uh, you know the the normal compost system. That's how I have it worked out. I find that to just be the easiest way to to process and to work it because you have to turn it and stuff. Um, is to separate out different kinds of material. Um, you know, also I throw leaves and grass clippings and stuff in there. Um, not that I bag leaves very often or um, bag my grass clippings at all, but I do sometimes just to get the added um, organic material. And um, so um, where was I going with that? Oh, so it's just, um, it's easier to, to separate all that out um, just because I don't know if you've ever tried to work compost when you have like thick woody um, stalks in there. It's just a pain in the ass to like turn or work or process or anything like that. Hmm. So I find it's just easier to separate it all out. And then I can work it in a little at a time at, you know, at my convenience as it rots. So. Gotcha. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, that's great to hear. And I guess as, as for right now, it's not like anything is going to waste. We've got a bunch of birds and they'll eat anything. Um, so, um, and, and, and right. you're, and you're talking about, you're talking about like man hours and such. And, and I mean, as, as far as like the cost of like the eggs and such, like there's no way that it's economical, um, for us to do that. But the way that I look at it, uh, the way that I look at it is that like, I can, I, the at next year they'll be on a, on a full corn and soy free recipe. Um, they'll be super like the healthiest eggs you can possibly, you can get them anywhere else. So like that's, so that's kind of the, like the, in, in terms of like the food waste too, 
Um, like I know you can get, um, like I've, I've seen it. They have like the organic, um, you know, compost and fertilizer and it's, it's not, it's not expensive at all. It's not really that expensive, but at the same time, um, if you know where your waste is coming from, I think that's, um, that's priceless, you know, even in terms of the main hours, you, you, you know, what's, you know, what the, the food that it came from. And it's, if it's nutritious food, then the compost skip will be more nutritious in the end. So I don't know. I don't, I don't I, I think that's exactly right. I know, I know exactly. No, you're exactly right. I know exactly what's going into my soil. It also gives me the opportunity to sort of dial in my because uh, I can make different soil mixes also. So I can add a little more of certain things to get a, a different NPK ratio. Right. Um, so I can I, it gives me that opportunity as well. And yes, a lot of the time, um, even the stuff, the, the organic fertilizers and stuff you get from the um, the store or whatever, they don't have like um uh, live microbiomes, you know? So like I have a, right. a, a small ecosystem inside of my compost bin that you're not getting from the bag stuff from the store. Exactly. And that, which that's is also that's a key, very, yeah, beneficial. that's a key thing. Yeah. That's a key point right there. Good point. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Cause all, uh, all the minerals and all that, all that's good. But if you have no, if you have no microorganisms to break it down or nothing to, yeah, if, if you have no microorganisms, they'll break down the soil and break down the nutrients to make them bioavailable to the plants. Then like, what's the point of it? So yeah, that's, that's like, a, that's another exactly key right. point right there. Yeah. Although I'm not going to lie. Okay. So again, I'll say I own a landscaping company. So sometimes I end up with excess material cause I do a lot of planting and installations. So I end up with like extra soil conditioner that I've, I, you know, I, I put a bunch of plants in on a job and I end up with an extra half a bag of soil conditioner. Yeah. That's going right in my compost too. I'm not going to lie. So, right. yeah, yeah. um, so yeah, but it's adding into all the rest of the stuff that I, I'm already adding to it. And yet more so the chickens eat a lot of it. Um, but they're making fertilizer for me too. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that goes in the compost as well or straight into the garden. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So that's, uh, that's all great information on the, on the composting. And, uh, in terms of the, the rainwater collection, I mean, it's not really, um, cause I, I had that kind of, that bit, that base that basic idea lined out in my head, but I just really hadn't, hadn't, hadn't really just like looked at it, but, um, that'll be a pro that'll definitely be a project for, um, coming up for this year is to, to get a better, we've got, we've got one right now that we use for like, uh, Oh, uh, we use we use it for a number of things, but, um, yeah, we want to get obviously a lot bigger where we're using a lot more, you know, more substantially rainwater. Um, but, um, I guess, yeah, do you, you have any thoughts? You want to get into that or you want to do the, uh, do you want to go do the worm composting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit. Water? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess there's worm composting too, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, let's go on to that yeah, first. Yeah. 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 Go for it. All right. So it's technically called vermicomposting. So you're, um, using animals to make, to compost the material. So the reason for this is they, uh, expedite the the process of breaking down material and they also turn it into much uh more condensed version of the nutrients were uh in question so generally speaking i the way i've done it is possibly the simplest and easiest way to do it um, you can build a big fancy bin with a screen on the bottom and a um, what they call worm tea, which is basically the liquid that comes from worm co composting, a, a collection system for that. And you can do all that, and you'll spend a, you know probably a ton of money doing it. But what I did is I took old totes. I think I have six or seven of them. And I drilled holes in the bottom and in the top. And uh, I just add... Um, I had mostly soft material in there, although, no, that's not true at all. Uh, most of the year, I'll just add soft material in there. But this time of the year, I'm adding a lot of woodier material, leaves, and grass clipping stalks from the um, from the plants that we just tore down, you know. Um, so they're, they're eating up on some old tomato plants and that kind of stuff because I'm winterizing them right now. Um, so I'm, I'm packing the bins real full of stuff that'll produce a lot of heat when it breaks down mm -hmm. and they'll turn that all and I'll just leave it closed for, you know, four, three, four months or so. And they'll turn that all into, um, worm castings. 
Um, last year, I got two five-gallon buckets full of worm castings from six bins over the winter. So what I did, um, back to what I did, I took uh, I took totes, drilled a hole in the top and the bottom. You put uh, some material in there, um, you know, uh, veggie scraps, leaves, um, any kind of vegetable matter that will break down. And then you put some worms on top, and then they usually like a nice layer of something on top of them. Um, you know, it could be straw, cardboard. It could be just, you know, grass clippings, uh, a layer of leaves, etc. They just like that. Um, if you put a layer on top, they will come closer to the surface, if that makes sense. They will work their way up, and they just seem to enjoy it. And so some people will... Um, collect um the worm the liquid that comes out of the bottom of that compost which is mostly worm pee and that is an excellent liquid fertilizer and so i was going to do that i had a i was I had a thought you know i was thinking about how to do it and um instead of doing that and having like gallons of worm pee storing around i had the thought of putting it up on timbers so I've got railroad ties. If any, if your audience can imagine this, I have two railroad ties going horizontally. And then widthwise, I have the worm bins uh, going the other way. So that would be like, let's say vertically, not vertically. So X, X axis, Y axis. The, the two landscape timbers are parallel to each other and the worm bins are sticking, uh, sitting the other way on the railroad ties. And I filled the railroad ties in between the railroad ties with soil and I plant in between the worm bins. So <clears throat> the liquid that drains out of the worm bins goes right into that soil and fertilizes whatever plants I'm growing there at the time. Um, we usually grow things that are smaller like uh, garlic or onions, um, nothing too big and bushy. Um, and so I eliminated a step by doing that. Um, I, so I don't have to collect and store worm pee because that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> and uh, it, for, it just goes right in and immediately just fertilizes um, the soil on, on its own. Um, so th this, uh, the reason I do this is um, it really um, makes the composting um, compost uh, composting happen faster, much faster. Um, they will go through uh, material much faster than it will uh, rot in a pile. Even though my compost pile has, or bins have worms in them, um, in a small condensed area, they will go through food very, very quickly. And they turn it into worm castings, which is uh, a, a excellent source of organic fertilizer, very rich. And um, the only things I would say to worry about if you're interested in doing this is don't let it get too wet in there. Um, if it starts, you start noticing it getting too wet, um, add some material that will soak up uh, some water. So, you know, wood shavings or mm -hmm. cardboard or newspaper and kind of just mix it all in together. If it gets too wet, the worms will eventually drown because it's not a natural environment for them. You're trying to recreate that natural environment, but it is still like a closed box that holds in moisture than more, more so than say the ground would. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to really be careful of um, it getting too wet in there. Cause they will just start to, to die off. I had that happen over the summer. I had, um, I lost probably half my population. It, it rained way more than it ever does in the summer. It was like raining like every day. And it got too wet in there too quickly. And um, I definitely noticed a significant reduction in the population. Um, you also have to worry about too many worms in there because they will start to cannibalize each other. And the genetics will start getting weird and they'll start growing really small if oh. there's too many in there. Hmm. Yeah. So you ha if you start noticing that, just what I do is... I mean, that's my source for worms, right? So if I start getting a lot in there, I'll take a handful or I might even restart the bin. So I might even take half of what's in there out 
put it in the compost bin or in my garden or wherever I want to, and then just add a bunch of new material to it and they'll spread out again and start, um, you know, filling in the area again. Um, so you have an endless source for worms for other applications too. You know, you, you know, take every year, a couple, actually I'm kind of doing it right now, but, um, I, I'll usually take a um, certain number of the population out, put some in the, you know, the compost bins and a few in my garden, and then I'll pack it full of material. So they break it down over the, the winter. And then again, in the spring, I will process all that and I'll split down the population again. And so I'll take a handful, throw them in the compost bin again, or the gardens, wherever, um, feed some to the chickens if I want to. Um, what we have here is, um, what they call red wigglers. It's a type of earthworm. And it doesn't get very big, but for the size, it um, processes material really quickly. Um, some people might tell you to use like night crawlers because they're so much bigger and they eat a lot. But the red wigglers proportionally actually eat more. Um, not more than the earthworm, but more in comparison um, when when um, adjusting for size, you know, mm -hmm. so um, they're supposed to be the best for composting. I, I, I've had good luck with them, although I will. If I find a worm in my yard, if I'm, you know, digging or whatever, I will throw it in there, too, to try to keep the. Um, uh, biodiversity going, the genetic biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same genes over and over again. Because I, I did buy my worms from a worm farm and they are likely all very, very inbred. If you can, if you've ever gotten a dog from a puppy mill, which I hope you don't, um, it's the same kind of idea. They're all very, very closely genetically related. So um, you can have uh, lots of weird things occur. Um, not so much diseases, but sort of deformities or... Um, they grow like flat or really small and skinny or weird, you know? So like I throw every now and then I'll throw um, worms that I find out and about in the wild in there just to kind of mix up the, um, the genetics a little bit. And that seems to help. Um, I think that's everything for the, the worm co composting, unless you had any questions. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, that's all. Uh, that's all really amazing information, I guess. Um, and and I guess now maybe you could eat, maybe it's uh, even a commercial commercial possibility too. You could freeze dry them and sell them. Um, the worms. Apparently, there's gonna be a big thing coming up soon. So I've thought about going into like a, starting a grass fed <laughs> mealworm farm or something. Um, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. But um, anyway. Uh, I mean, honestly, um, um, no, I, I will not eat z bugs. But um. Me growing mealworms and selling them is probably a good venture. Um, it's not something I have time for or the um, the setup. I would feel that I would have to go create a much larger surplus than I currently have with, like, say, my worms. Mm -hmm. um, but mealworms, um, they're a, uh, a lot of people that feed lots of different things with mealworms, like animals and, you know, chickens and lizards. Um, so it, it would be a good venture for somebody if they wanted to get into it. Um, apparently it's, you can get a pretty good price for, um, uh, selling mealworms. So something about it, but no, I'm not going to eat crickets or mealworms if I can help it. Well, you don't have to eat them. You just got to sell them. If people will eat the, right. Yeah. If people want to eat them and they can feel free to, I'm just not going to, but yeah, I get you. No, I get you. I'm not being serious, yeah, yeah. but, uh, anyway, yeah, that's, that's all, um, that's all amazing, man. That's all amazing. I'm looking forward to. Um, uh, I think that's on that project for next year, or maybe maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's project for the year after. I'm not. I don't remember exactly. Um, but I think we kind of decided that the we've got the birds for composting now, so we're not wasting anything. Um, and it's yeah, it's still getting recycled. Yeah, anyway, exactly. So it's not something that has yep. to be done like tomorrow. Yep. But anyway, um, maybe yeah, some folks are in a position where they they uh, need to look into that. And, and in which case, I, I I saw your setup and I thought it was. Uh, um, yeah, it it was uh, inspirational for me, so I will uh, certainly use it uh, use it for mine. Um, I guess moving on to this uh, this I guess next related thing, which you talked about in your podcast before, and um, yeah, I've 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 helped facilitate where I can, and um, 
it's uh you've you've got I guess a, a big gorilla gardening project um, ongoing at the moment. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and what's what's going on? Sure. Um, so I've been gorilla gar gorilla gardening for a number of years, and um, this year and going forward, I'm going to try to get as many people to uh, gorilla garden, excuse me, <clears throat> as possible. And um, I've had a number of volunteers, and I've I've sent people um, some seeds and that, and um, I've been doing a lot of it this fall as as well around here. Um, a few year, uh, quite a few years back, I was living in Southern California, and this was probably the biggest grill gardening project I did. But um, I was hanging out with some uh, with some let's say uh, nomads. Uh, they were, you know, punk rock kids. And um, we um, we started building um, gardens on sort of so-called public lands um, for near homeless encampments. <clears throat> so we sent up, uh, you know, I was kind of near L.A. Well, everything in Southern California is near, near L.A., but I was, uh, you know, let's say 40 minutes from L.A., and um, there was a lot of homeless there as well. And we would just start building garden plots and setting up water collection systems um, to feed the homeless. And some of the homeless got involved as well, um, started helping us out. And we'd just hand out the food or they could pick it or whatever. And we just, uh, we had probably six or eight of these. Um, you know, one of them was in an area along... Um, canal they, a lot of people camped under this bridge like in the canal so we had it in this area along the canal and um we were probably keeping at least several maybe a dozen people fed um oh. just at least during during pick them well during picking time anyway right um and we'd also like um go down there and pick some of the veggies make soup with it bring you know bring some chicken with us or that that kind of stuff and um, we never really got hassled. I thought we would have, we had a cop drive by one time and they were looking at us. They kind of stopped and we're just looking at us out of the cop car window. And I thought, oh, for sure we're getting busted now. And they just drove off and, um, you know, it's Southern California, you know, they have a lot of other things to worry about. They weren't worried about some street punks you know, feeding the homeless, I guess at that pot, that time anyway. Um, so one thing I learned though is, um, well, first I should probably define gorilla gardening. Gorilla gardening is gardening where you do not have permission to, to do so. So let's, uh, some examples of this are government property. Um, let's see, um, you know, corporate property, private property, uh, abandoned property, any of those things. Now, for the purposes of, you know, sort of this audience, your prime targets are probably abandoned property and government property. Now, um, the reason I'm pushing for this initiative now is for a number of reasons. Um, on our podcast more recently, we've been very concerned and leaning up in the direction of if we can change material conditions, we can create a society that we want to live in, um, a free society. Um, so, you know, that comes with, you know, taking production into your own hands and sort of reimagining our relationship with production and technology and all of these sorts of things. Um, to me, this gives, the more we outsource this, the more it grants power to those who do not have our best interest in, in mind, right? So if you couple this with like, um, you know, the state claims to be um, the service that provides for those who cannot provide for themselves. If we can gorilla garden, it's going to, if everybody just did a little bit and it doesn't take much effort, um, we can solve many problems simultaneously. One, we can um, delegitimize the concept of state property altogether. Two, we can um, more benefit uh, our ecological system. 
um, so we can help rejuvenate the ecological system that our corporate uh, society has been um, degrading for decades. Uh, three, we can create an abundance of food. Um, so when people are, um, let's say, going through economic strife, when the economy is, is going into the toilet, people clamor for the state. People get more fascistic, right? This is why fascism rose in Europe, right? Because everybody was um, going through an economic depression. So um, if we can sort of get people out of the scarcity mindset, like if people are worried about where they're going to um, where they're going to eat and uh, where their next meal's coming from, um, they're not worried about our um, political philosophy, right? No, you can't if until we start to solve these problems, people aren't going to be concerned about anarchism or anything of the sort or freedom. They're just worried about where food is coming from. So we can change the material conditions on the ground, which is will again change the material base to create a free society. So we, if we can create this through sheer abundance. And um, also we can have a fun time, fun time doing it. There was another point that I had, but I, I forgot. But essentially, we can create a, um, with very little effort, if everybody just pitches in a little, we can solve a lot of problems simultaneously. And also, we can have food growing wild again. So anybody that is hungry or just uh, can go pick it, or you just know where there's a stash spot of food growing, growing wild, so you can go pick it yourself. And... Um, also, this is going to sh demonstrate in practice that the state is unnecessary to provide these things. We can take care of our own communities, and um, we can take care of our manage our own ecological systems, and um, we can feed um, those less fortunate than ourselves without any necessary uh, necessity for for uh, you know a, a centralized monopoly on violence. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I'm doing the push again. Well, I'm doing this big push now because I believe this to be more as time goes on and the economy gets worse, this is going to be going to become more and more ne necessary. And we must provide an alternative to some sort of rise of, of, you know, fascism or, or central, more centralization of power Um to deal with the um, economic downturn that we're heading towards or already in. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's the, the kind of the gist of it. Um, did you have any questions on that? Um, so that's, that's, that's all amazing. I, I, I love to hear it. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Bonnie listeners love to hear it too. I know there's at least a num a, at least a couple of them that are, that are helping out with it. But um, I guess a couple things that come to mind initially is um you know, uh, hopefully next year we'll, um, you know, the, the Pasnia map and directory will be, be put together. Um, and if anyone has, uh, you know, a piece of property they'd like to add to the Pasnia map or directory, this the first one will be the vetted one. So, um, obviously, yeah, go uh, pasnia.com forward slash join. You can look at all the privacy and security security um, information there. But if you do have a, you know, a piece of property, a, a, you know, a parking spot for a van nomad, um, you know, a couch in an apartment, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it is. And in this case, maybe, um, maybe you've been maintaining a gorilla gardening patch somewhere where, you know, Venuans, if they're traveling through, can go pick it, you know, pick some tomatoes or something. Right. Um, so those could be added to the, um, the Pasnia map and directories too, just, just as a, a thought that came up. And then another idea that, oh, that, oh yep, go for it. Mm -hmm. I, on that, it's funny you say this. This is this is amazing how like things kind of come together like this. <laughs> number one, I I am also joining the map, so everyone should go join the map. But number two, I was just talking about this with our mutual friend Silas Soul, and I'm getting him set up with. Uh, he's a van nomad, and I'm getting him set up with supplies so he can as he travels throughout the country gorilla garden and he said oh wouldn't it be great if we had some sort of resource where i could mark all of these places on a map that and other nomads could do the same so that you would know hey there's blackberries planted over here if you want to stop hey there's squash you know hey there's wild asparagus parked over here if you're going by grab something you know so right. that would be a great resource for people that are nomadic as well, because, you know, like he said, he's like, I'm in a lot of the same places, 
you know, a lot of the time, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, it would totally make sense for me to have like stash spots growing all over the country. So I'm, right. um, I'm setting him up as well. And if any of your listeners are listening and you want seeds and you cannot afford seeds, but you are willing to volunteer to go do this, let me know. I will send you seeds because I have, I've been getting donations for this and I have a connect for seeds and I can get, um, I can send you some, just reach out to me. I'm sec Magora on Twitter, telegram, and I think discord as well. So if you can't afford to buy seeds, but you have the willingness and the ability to go plant them, let me know. I will hook you up. So that being yeah. said, sorry, I interrupted Amazing. you. No, you're good, man. You're, you're good. No, you're, you're, you're definitely good. But that, uh, it's happy here. That's, that's, uh, flies flying around here but uh anyway yeah that's that's awesome that's kind of uh you know coming together already um because i was just yeah just thought that you know popped in my head it'd be it'd be good and especially for those like if um i kind of i kind of envisioned down the road with the with the you know the with uh you know kind of this made their this this directory and kind of network that you know van nomads could create their own uh you know to create their own you know second realm income um you know by just going along these trade routes and then further beyond that if they're going along these same trade routes as, as Silas pointed out then you know like you could have a pretty resilient lifestyle and um you know um yeah this would be like the this would be like the smoom and super hobo um idea that rayo talked about like maximized you know um you know maximized and then you toss in ideas like uh i'm gonna do an episode <clears throat> at some point i have a chance to look into it more but um the possibilities with these uh these electric bikes that have you know, that have solar panels and like you can put char chart accessories with them and stuff so like it's like as, as for like a um like an off-grid tent camping van nomad like the pot like with with something like this too i mean the possibilities for a lifestyle like 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 these like that's there's a lot of po a lot of possibilities now yeah it's never been an easier than now you know mm -hmm. the way that technology is progressing and the you know the gadgets and the gizmos that are coming out that makes these things like easier and, and cheaper and it's it's even you know um it's way easier than it was for Rayo in the '60s, right? To just oh, go God. and yeah, he, and get he was gone he was hauling around a he whatever. was hauling around a typewriter, and like you you could have like you could have like mm -hmm. your little electric bike solar set up with a with a laptop plugged into it, just you know typing on it in the middle of the woods with probably a with a with a with a, a, a hotspot too, like a Calix hotspot with unlimited Wi-Fi and you know, private hotspots. So like the, it's it's crazy what's possible today. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. I know you could be a hobo. And uh, in the woods and working remote, you know you what could. I mean. Like uh, you could be working on your laptop remote, like in the middle of nowhere, just like right, right near electric bike or you know your exercise bike or whatever, and just typing away or doing whatever you're doing, you know. But um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm 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 generally optimistic, mostly for that reason. It's uh, technology in some ways seems to be bifurcated in the sense that it's becoming more centralized, but there's also so many more opportunities for the decentralization of power and uh, technology and production at the same time, just mainly because things are getting cheaper in some ways, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of democratizes the, the, the technology across the population, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, and this information is becoming more decentralized too. And people are, you know, I, I know people on Twitter that just build Bitcoin hardware, for example. So like that, that hardware for that could be also be used for, for what we're talking about too, um, you know, solar panels and such. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a different world. And the, the other idea that comes to mind and, um, and, and it comes to mind because uh, I guess like a corp, uh, corporate report mentioned sedition, ver, seditions version sabotage um, today. They put out a solutions watch video on simple sabotage, and I'm not going to implicate I anybody here. But if uh, but I guess another possibility I know like I, and I know like I, I know you've thought about this before at least. But um, you could also use guerrilla gardening as a simple sabotage ta ta uh, you know tactic or technique, right? You want could you, you I guess just give give the listeners some ideas if you could. Uh. Okay, so hypothetically speaking. Of course, yeah, of course, hypothetically speaking. If one if one knew of a location where say let's uh, you know, a police station or let's say a impound yard for the drug task force of your local area or you know a uh, munitions a weapons factory that makes uh, weapons for the government, you could certainly start planting things that would uh, at the very least, irritate or destroy or slow slow them down. So I'm thinking of things like 
invasive vines or poison ivy or if you have a um, or marijuana in the lo- in the flower pot at the local police station or um, blackberries along the fence line of a uh, drug task force impound lot or um, you know there's a there's a SWAT vehicle and you know where I live the next town over has a SWAT vehicle it's absolutely like a MRAP (laughs) so they've got it in this little yard and right above them you know right up behind them is the railroad tracks that's like up above their um, thing so you could be walking along the railroad tracks and just start throwing seeds over the fence into this lot and they could have a field of pot growing in there or whatever you wanted to do to just piss these people off um you know kudzu or or bitter or some kind of vine that's just bamboo yeah that's 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 what came to mind for me and invasive bamboo to where like uh, that'd be like 10 years down the road like you're you'd be you'd be fucking up their foundation like that's some hardcore like (laughs) some hardcore stuff down the road yep yeah this is the other half of this uh that i really enjoy is because you I like trickster prankster kind of stuff. That's my kind of my jam. So like just little things like that. You can really have fun. Number one, it's a fun hobby, but number two, you can really just like in small little ways, just stick it to the man, you know, and just fuck with them just a little bit. Just, just enough. To like if one person at, let's say somebody planted blackberries along the drug task force, um, impound yard, if one, and they grew through the fence. If one person, one of them fucking pigs, gets their arm scratched, I'm a happy man. You know what I mean? Like, it's just that little dig. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but, I mean, picture a Lockheed Mar- Mar- Martin factory. You know, you could start planting, like you said, bamboo or fucking grapevines, stuff that's really hard to get rid of, and it starts screwing with their factory. They're paying tons of money to try to get rid of this stuff. Um, you know, plant it all along their fence. Or, you know what? If you don't, you know, plant flowers, plant flowers all along the fence at, you know, just like wildflowers, just to kind of make a statement to like make something beautiful out of something so horrid. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, there you go. So, um, and it's also feeding the bees and you know what I mean? And also you're kind of making a statement and they're, they go out and they're like, why the fuck is there flowers all around? Like, it's just a weird thing. Kind of weirds them out a little bit. You know, I, I like screwing with their heads a little. Um, but in terms of like destroying machinery and stuff, that kind of sabotage, eh, it'd be a little harder to do with plants, but you could definitely do some minor damage to these places just with plants for sure. Interesting. Good, good to know. Good to know. So, um, I guess, um, before we get on to you, I mean, we don't have to, I mean, we'll have to spend two, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm curious to, to get your thoughts on it, but, uh, before we get to, I guess the, the non-solutions oriented stuff, did you have any, any other closing thoughts here? I guess, uh. Um, advice you want to pass along on the, the composting or rainwater collection um, or any other anything else pertaining to the gorilla gardening project oh do you want to do oh so if you are interested in the gorilla gardening project find me on um, the only social media i'm on is twitter and uh, unless you consider telegram social media but i'm sec magora um i'm an at sec magora all one word m-c-g-o-r-a and on twitter and um if you're interested in grill gardening reach out to me i will help you in any way that i can um i'll teach you how to do it teach you what you need to know how to, what not to do oh one more thing on that mm-hmm. so the thing i learned on in california is to not make huge garden plots that's probably not the move you want to be a, a little bit more subtle now i was lucky i didn't get screwed hassled by the cops at all which was surprising i did it for years but maybe you're not living outside of LA where they have like way more like murders to worry about. Right. <laughs> so you might want to be a little more incons- inconspicuous with your gardening, go for more of a food forest approach and just sort of um, sneak plants and seeds in little areas and, and spread them around a little bit. So it's not like a formal garden. Right. Um, that way, you know, people that know what they're looking for can still find it, but, it's not so quite so obvious unless you really want to make a statement and get arrested. If so, by all means, I mean, do it. I get it. 
Um, but I, that would be my only advice on that. But if you are need help getting started, find me, I'll help you. Um, awesome. but the rainwater, what, um, what we didn't talk about the rainwater. Oh, I guess we didn't talk what, about what, that. Um, um, uh, yeah, well, I guess there, there wasn't, no. it's, yeah, there was, we didn't, we really didn't talk about that, but, um, but ba- I, I guess basically the, um, the, the setup that I, that I envisioned was just this kind of those, uh, just for, for me, for speaking for myself and I saw it at your place, but basically just, uh. Um, you know, um, any kind of collection container, and then you can just add a water spigot to it. And then, if you wanted to, you could add like a solar, solar, you know, solar powered pump, um, things like that. But basically, yeah, ways to ways to to, to ways to make uh, watering easier, um, where the water is right there. And um, yeah, I guess. But, but did you have? I guess. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about a little bit about your setup? Anything you've learned, or um, anything you'd pass along that that uh, in this area? Sure. Um, so I have two. I have gutter, gutters on my shed, and I have two rain barrels. They're the fifty, the ones you envision, uh, the fifty-five gallon um, drums. They're blue plastic, food grade. And actually, the reason I have so many of those is I was um, buying those in bulk uh, from a guy and selling them. Um, so I, I got them all for free, or I got. I actually, I mean, I made I made money on it. So it was a little side hustle I was doing for a while there. Um, so I have 12 of those. I th- no, there's probably, I have, I have more than those now. I have 15 or so filled at, at 55 gallons a piece. Um, I think 12 of them I have spigots on. So I just, you drill a three quarter inch hole. You get, you can buy them online. They're just spigots with a seal on either side and you just thread them in together and uh it seals i also put silicone on all of them just because i don't want them to leak and i don't always trust factory seals Mm -hmm. so i put uh, red gasket maker silicone on all of them and i also have a 275 gallon ibc tote um, that's also full so what i do is essentially the two barrels that are connected to my downspouts on my shed um that's collecting all that water from the entire shed which during a good rainstorm it'll fill that 55 gallon barrel really quickly now i have a diverter to where once it fills that one um it goes into my ibc tote but once both of those are full i have you know 12 or so other ones out um closer to my gardens um just mostly for ease of use and i'll I'll usually pump from the two that are under my downspouts or my IBC tote out to um, those. And those who are what I mostly use for watering the gardens and, you know, feeding the chickens and, or sorry, watering the chickens. And um, I mostly just use it for irrigation. Now this past year I was, um, we irrigated completely um, off of rainwater without any problems we didn't come close to running out now i have about 20 more um rain barrels that i um 20 more 55 gallon drums that i that are um empty that are uh, they need to be rinsed out and i'm i'm going to start filling those as well probably over towards my outer garden so um what might be a better solution i think actually is um, to get the IBC totes over the, um, well, I, I still might have both. I mean, I got those cause I had a steady connect for them at a cheap price and I was buying and selling them. So I have a ton of those, but, um, I would go with the IBC. I don't know if everybody knows what an IBC tote is. So it's a 250 gallon tank, plastic tank with a metal cage around it. You've probably seen them around. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to find one that you got to know what's been in that though. Cause a lot of those were used for things you don't want to store water. in. um, you can usually find them used for like 40 bucks, mm-hmm. maybe 50 or 60 depending. But, right. um, I would actually use those over, over the rain barrels. I would, even if I had mostly IBC totes, I'd probably keep a few rain barrels just because I like having uh, a few like near the garden or whatever. I would probably place those around, um, because you know if you've got ibc totes you know chances are 
those are harder to move around number one when they're full i mean i have a bobcat so i can move them wherever i want but um once that thing's full it's hard you're not going to be able to move it it'd mm-hmm. even be heavy to move a- empty right <clears throat> so i'd i'd almost have like um a couple different central locations for your ivc totes and then maybe like a couple few 55 gallon drums for different purposes you know one for this garden or one for that garden or whatever one for your chicken area or you know that kind of stuff so the mobility of the 55 gallon drums is a little bit better um than the ibc totes but you could hold a lot more water in the ibc totes and i think in terms of bang for your buck like i was selling those rain barrels for like 20 dollars a piece when i could buy an ibc tote with for and those are the ones you uh the blue barrels are 55 gallons and I was selling them for twenty dollars a piece, and the IBC totes are two seventy five. Sometimes you can get them in three hundred gallons, and they're like forty bucks used. Mm-hmm. These are all used, by the way. Right. So you'll probably get more bang for your buck that way, is what I'm saying. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, we use a bunch of those for the distillery from for the spent mash, and um, yeah, I guess the the ones that the ones that we use there, I guess it was like a vitamin, uh, some sort of vitamin, it might be vitamin E or something for for you know um, for for cows or something. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, those are, yeah, I think we're going for like 50 bucks a piece. Um, you just use once too. like they use them once and they, and then they sell them used and like 50 bucks. So yeah, that, that might actually be a, 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 be, a better, uh, a better, more efficient route. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. As long as you know what's been in those, a lot of those, a lot of those totes are used for like a lot of various chemicals. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. So you got to find out what was, you could definitely have to find out what was in them beforehand. Oh yeah. For sure. Um, but they, that might be a better, more efficient route or do both. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you've got downspouts, maybe put the, the totes under your downspouts to collect all the rain. Uh, but then, like I said, have some 55 gallon barrels spread around that you can move or be more mobile um, for various applications, you know, watering this or that or, or what have you. Mm-hmm. So, but. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, again, I'm glad that glad we we talked about that because that that might uh, that might be easier to get and it would yeah, be yeah more efficient. So um, yeah, some for me to ponder and uh, certainly for for the audience too. I guess uh, anything else on rainwater collection? Um. So yes, you definitely need a pump. And before anybody tries to tell you that you can just raise it up, mm, <laughs> no, you can't. I mean, you can, and you'll get more more pressure out of it but it's minimal. You're never going to be able to like run an irrigation system or a hose or like a sprinkler from, you're not going to be able to get it high enough. I can't remember the exact math, but I want to say it's 10 feet for one PSI. So you'd have to get that thing like 40 feet in the air. So a regular garden hose is like 40 PSI. So you'd have to have that thing like, 40 i believe it was like 40 feet in the air to actually get that kind of presser pressure and at that point it's like i'm not i'm not putting my rain barrel for i'm not building a (laughs) platform 40 feet in the air for my rain barrel right and now check my numbers those aren't the right numbers but it was something to ridiculous like that to actually get the psa you'd need that comes out of your like spigot for your garden hose Mm -hmm. so it's not worth it just get the pump uh, the electric pump, and then you can just water your gardens or run an irrigation system with that. Um, and like you said, you can have different setups for solar or batteries or, or, or what have you. And, you know, you can get a pump for like 50, 100 bucks and it works fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the only thing. Don't think you're going to be able to raise it up enough to actually run, um, ha- get enough pressure to run an irrigation system. It's just right. not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Good points for sure. So, um, okay, um, yeah. So I guess we'll we'll go ahead and conclude with the I guess the non solutions oriented stuff here, uh, pertaining to and I guess just a, a little brief introduction because the episode has not come out yet. All I did was post a little teaser in the Pasnia chat, but um, but yeah, essentially I just interviewed Corey Hughes, who is a uh, um, a historical researcher, and he uh, he spent the last four years dedicated to solving the JFK case, and um, through his uh, research, he's fa- he found that Carrie Thornley was uh, was pretty involved. Um, just to, to put it mildly in that, um, 
Yeah, that uh, he was pretty much intelligence the whole time. Um, I guess what is what Corey's Corey's conclusion was, and um, I guess before before talking to him, I'd, I'd read the, I'd read one book um, called Caught in the Crossfire, but at, at by Adam Go Rightly, who was a friend of Carrie, who was trying to vindicate him. I was kind of leaning more towards like, oh, he's kind of dumb and dumb and naive, and then he ended up going nuts. So like, he might have just been kind of you know, um, yeah, he might just gone nuts. But at the same time, but but yeah, but but then yeah, talking to Corey today is like, no, like I, I'm pretty sure that. I'm pretty sure his intelligence. And then there's this stuff with the with the, the with the Discordian Society being a CIA front, which Adam also talks about in that book. Um, and there's some interesting connections there. So it's it's um uh, it's a doozy. It's a doozy. And um, I guess even beyond that, so Kerry was Kerry was involved with the JFK assassination, and uh, he was actually arrested in the theater in the balcony um, about the same time as Oswald. He was uh, there's there's witness reports of a second Oswald being arrested upstairs, and that was Kerry. Um, so. Um, so yeah, there's that. And I guess he, I guess he killed a uh, officer JD Tibbetts too. Um, who, he wasn't just like an innocent, uh, an innocent police officer or anything. He was, uh, I guess, in on it too, apparently. So he got, he got, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I guess that happened. So I guess, uh, um, sec, I'm not sure how much you've, as it just happened. Um, haven't even gotten it out yet. So I'm not sure how much you've listened to, but from what we've talked about it so far, I guess, what are your, <laughs> what are your initial thoughts? I know you've stumbled across this stuff before, but it was probably a lot like me last year where it was just kind of like, oh, this is probably just kind of entertainment nonsense. Um, but yeah, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I, I have vaguely heard this, that, that Carrie Thornley was, um, involved with Oswald and the JFK shooting. And when I heard it, um, well, I mean, going, okay. So going back it up a little bit as a lad, my, my parents were, uh, truthers, conspiracy, uh, you know, theorist. And I, I don't mean that in a pejorative at all. So like, um, when I was a, a kid, it was one of the elections and I want to say it was Clinton and Bush and I came home and we're doing a project in school doing a mock election. And I came home and asked my dad, are we Republican or are we Democrat? And my dad was not good at explaining things, but he went into some rant about, uh, you know, both Clinton and the Bushes, they both work for the Illuminati and the Bush family killed uh, with, you know, Alan Dulles killed JFK and this and that. So he went into this like huge tirade and, you know, I'm a young kid and I'm like, so we're, we're independent then. Like, I don't, I don't know. So like um, he was not good at uh, enunciating. So that's like, my baseline that was my up growing mm -hmm. growing up and i i went into a deep dive in the jfk but I, it's been a very long time since i've researched it and at, at the end i i kind of just uh, i didn't have an exact thought a uh, uh, exact theory as to what exactly happened but uh, you know um obviously it was not oswald um but i haven't at a certain point it's like well you know, how much does this really affect me? And I, I haven't really researched it in like right. you know, 10, 15 years. So my, what I know of Carrie Thornley is mostly, I, I know very little about Carrie Thornley. And when I heard it, I, I kind of was just like, it, uh, when I heard that the, the association with the JFK, I kind of just shrugged and I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know about all that, you know, uh, it sounds silly to me. But um, it seems that there is at least some truth to it. But my the only um, the only reason I even know Carrie Thornley is most, mostly through um, Robert Anton Wilson, who at least was one of my favorite anarchists, and the um, the the Church of Discordia. Um, that's my introduction because um, you know Carrie Thornley. I think they called him Lord Omar. And he was one of the mm -hmm. people that wrote for um, the principal Discordia. And it's something that I've been interested in for a, a number of years. And um, Robert Anton Wilson is what probably, I mean, I, I really enjoyed a lot of his work, especially the Illuminatus trilogy. And he was um, close friends with Carl Hess and they did uh, a lot of activism together and such. And um, Discordian is, I've always been kind of fond of that for years now. It, it's just a, it's a joke, but it's also serious at the same time kind of a thing. You know, it's back to that trickster mischievous stuff. So they did a lot of culture jamming and, and, and whatnot. So that was, that's my jam. And it'd be really weird if that's a CIA front that, that kind of ruined my day. 
Um, but I'd have to really, really think so. So going into this, I have a an obvious bias, right, of being fond of both Robert Anton Wilson and the um, the Church of Discordia and Carrie Thornley. I, I could you could take it or leave it. I'm not I'm not all that fond of him. I don't really um, know much about him. So I did listen to your episode with Corey and. You know, he, he makes some compelling arguments, but again, I, I, I'm not fully informed enough to make a, um, mm-hmm. a decision about it one way or another. Um, he does make a lot of declarative statements, so I'd have to really go back and watch either some of his videos or kind of research some of the evidence he's pre- presenting for this. It does seem like, from what I understand, that um, obviously Carrie Thornley was in the Marines, right? And maybe he was recruited out of the Marines um, into the CIA, into intelligence. And he was a bit of a weirdo. And um, maybe he was involved in the the Oswald thing. But, you know, is it possible, though, that he walked away from there, um, that scared the shit out of him, and then he turned his back on it, you know? Like, um, I don't know. There's been a lot of... um, activists and anarchists or whatever that were former you know military or government whatever and they just saw how the sausage is made really and uh it it sort of scared them straight so to speak so i don't know if um it just knowing what i know about the um church of discordia i don't it would be hard hard to believe what if it's a cia front they're acting they're not acting their own interests um but if you can kind of go back to the N- mk ultra experiments like um i often see that there's like two types of people there's you know people that <laughs> trust the cia and underestimate it and then there's people that like drastically overestimate <laughs> the ability of the cia right so like you go back to mk ultra right and um i've always been interested in psychedelics um for going up and sort of the counterculture that goes with that you know i was i was definitely into i mean obviously hunter s thompson but the merry pranksters and timothy leary and terrence mckenna and um you know going back to years ago when i was researching the cia it's like oh guess what that was entirely all supplied by the cia right but here's the thing so all of the LSD that was like coming into uh, the hippie movement in the United States, that was almost all coming from the CIA. Mm-hmm. Um, and, th- and they were doing a lot of acid tests and a lot of experiments in mind control using CIA and they were releasing it and testing it. But do you think that the, like their desired end result was like a giant anti-war protest for Vietnam or the hippie movements, pro- you know, protesting or the, um, you know, like the the hippie counterculture. Do you think that that was their desired end goal? You know, like I think that was like um, it got out of their own hands. You know, that's sure. not what they were necessarily going for. Um, they wanted mindless drones, and what psychedelics does, it's not really it doesn't make you a mindless drone. It enhances your not. I won't say enhances, but it opens your mind to other possibilities and ways of thinking. And um, I think the, the the unforeseen byproduct of their LSD experiments was the hippie movement, which then turned into the anti-nuclear weapons movement and the anti-war movement, um, which mm-hmm. arguably could have possibly ended Vietnam and slowed down the war machine for at least a, you know, a, a couple of decades. So I don't think that was their end goal, right? So maybe, maybe... Uh, Thornley was an asset and man, I really hope Wilson wasn't, but maybe he was too, but um, maybe they um, ended up being like sort of loose cannons at the end. You know, they got out of their own, um, they uh, they got out of hand as well, just like the LSD experiments did. So I don't know. I don't know. I have to dig more into it, but um, my, like I said, my first bias is to be like, no, it can't be true. So, um, 
I don't know, but right. you sound pretty convinced like <sighs> that you've. So, so I guess, so, so what I'll, what I'll say is that, um, and, and it's, it's just like the amount of connections. It's like, as I read that the, some of that letter that he sent when he was, you know, in the mental hospital, he sent, sent to his doctors. Um, and he went through like all the connections, like direct connections to him. And then a few, I guess, kind of secondary, more uh, secondary connections. And he's like, yeah, I would, I would, you know, consider myself guilty too with all these connections. Um, it's like, so, so like there's, there's that, like it's, it's unavoidable. Um, and he, he even admits it. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just, uh, um, and then, yeah, he even, he even suspected towards the end, um, like himself and it could, could just be him trying to, you know, rationalize or justify it, but that he was, he was actually so that he was set up as a patsy too. So he even kind of came to, came to that, that potential realization too, whether it was, um, you know, for, you know, to, to for self-preservation or for other reasons, you know? Um, so I guess the, what, well, they, yeah. I mean, they, they burn their own guys all the time. Right. So mm -hmm. like I, if, so if he was, even if he was being set up as a patsy, that doesn't really vindicate him either. You really? Know what yeah, I mean? true. Like, um, yeah. maybe he just got out of line a little too much and they, you know, they, they definitely burn their own agents all the time, you know? So, um, I guess, okay. So what's, what's the story then? Like from what I understand, Carrie Thornley, was simultaneously an Oswald impersonator, but also Oswald's handler. Um, Is that the so, idea? Um, like he was his so handler. So Corey kind of correct corrected me today a little bit um, that he wasn't necessarily he might not he might not have been impersonating him, but um, like impersonating like that by by definition like in that sense. But um, he might he might have been handled too. Like Thornley might have been handled too. But Corey presumed that that Thornley was above Oswald. Um, was his um, yeah is his conclusion. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess that would be the, to answer your question that, yeah, that would mean that, yeah, Thornley would be Oswald's, I guess, in a sense, but then Oswald wasn't even really, was, was never really there. So I don't know. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of a mind fuck and it, it really is now. And I would, I would point people in the direction of, um, cause really the, the best way to go through it. And, and, and so the way that I looked at it was like, I spent quite a bit of time. I went through a seven hour documentary, like three times. And I already read a book on, I've got one more I'm going to read. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in a couple of few weeks span. But after this, like, I'm pretty, like, I will be happy. Like, I'm not going to say like, I'm a hundred percent confidence, but I will be happy. Like with the JFK assassination, like I will be pretty satisfied. Um, cause and with, like, with, with like, with what, and even if like, a, even if a detail or two is wrong, that really doesn't matter because, um, as we were talking about in pre-show, what was more um, beneficial for me looking into this entire thing was just seeing kind of, um, I guess it was more about like the 20th century makes a lot more sense um, examining it in this way. Um, so I guess that, that, so that's, that's, that's another thing. Um, cause you, you were right to point out, like it was, it really wasn't like that directly impactful to my life, to you, to your life potentially. So you kind of stopped looking into it. And that's always been my, my, my perspective, my, I guess my, my viewpoint on it. Um, but, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm, after, after a certain point, right. Once you understand like how things really work, yeah. you know, um, you know, like, yes, of course. I mean, to the, I mean, I'm pretty darn sure the CIA killed JFK, probably in cahoots with the mafia and some, you know, anti Castro Cubans, probably run by George Bush and the Dulles brothers. And um, yeah, I mean, once like the details after that are like, once you understand, I mean, what if you go back and understand like the origins of the CIA as an intelligence network for some of the most powerful families in the world dealing opium mostly into Asia and China. Um, that's how it started. And they were murdering people back then and, 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 you know, spy craft and blackmailing and whatever else. And like, that's how that was the precursor to even actually that was a precursor to MI6 mostly, but that's who started, uh, help start the OSS. So that's where the origins of these things come from. So it's like, okay, I mean, that's how the world really works. Right. So like once you're like, OK, that's how the world really works. The, the details, details are less much. important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, and then you're just concerned about what's happening, you know, in your own life. Right. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's you can spend a lot of time getting sucked down this rabbit hole and you could 
probably be doing. Yeah, I could be outside. You know what I mean? So right. Yes, and and um, that, I guess there, there's the other the other interesting angle too, the historical one, and 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 you know always obviously in reference to Bonnie with Carrie, I guess yeah, with with Thornley, um, with whatever, um, with whatever, however much or however little, regardless, there's that that historical significance too. And I I, I kind of just I I want to read because there's not that much out there, right? It's not like um, it's not it's yeah thornley is kind of like one of the minor characters even though he seems to be more 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 one of the major ones so there's only like a few books on it so like i can get through it pretty quick and then kind of move on to better better and more important things and feel satisfied so um right yeah that's that's kind of kind of, kind of where i'm at and then i can and well, i, I well, can also expect that process for others what's that what's up yeah what was his what was his role then like he was just supposed to handle oswald and then take out the the cop so um so basic or... so basically he and william seymour were um when oswald was not even in was not even in the i guess not even in the country um not even you know but not even detect like i guess yeah not even around um their goal with like their job um so william i guess william seymour and there was one other guy that was with him they went and impersonated him at a shooting range and basically spat it off at a bunch of communist stuff and were shooting at each other shooting at like someone else's target on the shooting range making a big ruckus um, so they were like, so, so William, I guess that was one, one case. And then the other, I guess one that one of the more common, common ones with Kerry was, um, I guess the anti, I guess the, what the anti, I guess whatever the Cuban group was that he passed that, that Oswald passed out flyers for, well, that was actually Kerry Thornley. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, so basically it was, it was putting like basically building up the, so his, whether again, whether he knowingly did it or not, like we can't, I can't, we can't go ask him and like, and it's going to be hard to figure that out for sure. But, um, whether he knowingly did or not, the the goal was to um, basically build up this persona of Oswald um, that would be um, that would you know and you build up build up this persona and, and build up this reputation, um, you know the the Patsy per, Patsy per, Patsy per se. So yeah, that I guess that's that's kind of the long okay. the, the short answer. And then after that, you think he went on to create, be an anarchist, like okay. So this would imply that like the CIA wants anarchists to exist, right? Like um wants anarchist thinkers to to be out there, uh, you know, sort of um so writing and thinking about a- anarchism, right? So so I I guess the, the the other aspect of this too is that it was a, it was a very I guess the the other I guess the other thing I, I really I I hadn't looked into the 60s all that much and apparently there were a lot of people that like a lot there was a lot of talk about a lot of talk about people assassinating JFK it was like a very open conversation so like um I mean, um, and, and, and he even, even before, like, I, I guess there were even, I guess there were even some political writings from, from, from Thornley before that. Um, but I don't know, I, I got, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get in, um, I, I was trying to understand his, I guess, where Carrie, Carrie, Carrie could have been at this time. And Corey was kind of explaining the details, but, you know, he was you know, young in the Marines and, um, he thought, and he wrote about, you know, um, Kennedy being, you know, a communist who was responsible for, um, you know, as any president is right, they're responsible for the lots of, lots of deaths of innocence. Um, so like he, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm not sure what Carrie's pers- I'm not I'm not sure what Carrie's perspective was on it. Um, I guess at that point, but after, oh. but after afterwards, I mean, um, it, and this is this is what really confuses me is because like he did this, like you know, like he he was involved with this. Um, he was involved in the JD Tippett thing. You know, assuming that's all correct. And then in 1963 or 64, he started writing for Innovator as an editor. Um, which then became under, I guess, which apparently came out um, later on that was under surveillance by the FBI. Um. And then, yeah, Ocean Freedom Notes, which the uh, Permanent Floating Voluntary Society book came out of. Um, and, yeah, like looking from and that, that's what that's what's because I, I, I kind of feel like I'm a good judge of people, you know, being able to read, their, you know, reading their words and such. And it seemed like he would be 100 percent anti-coercion. Um, so, like, I don't see like, I, I mean, just just squaring it based based off of what I've read. Like, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to reckon with, as, as I told you, like, it's hard for me to, to, to reckon with. I'm not I'm obviously I'm not I'm not really I'm not really sure yet. Uh, like where I stand, I've got to read that other book and, and, and I'll kind of, I'll see where I sit after that. But, um, yeah, it's just, um, I guess get, getting back to it, it's the, it's the connections. Like even he's, even he, even curious is like, it's like, this is like, it's the, like, it's beyond coincidence. Like there's like, it's beyond coincidence. I would consider myself guilty. Um, it's crazy. Like when you see all the connections around him, there's like, you don't, you don't end up like in that swamp. And then like, it, I don't know how else to put it. Right. Like if you're in that swamp with all those people, like you probably aren't, a, you're probably a swamp creature too. I don't know. That's kind of just, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure, but that's not evidence or anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. So, but, but then you have people like Smedley Butler, right? So, I mean, Smedley Butler, right. I mean, he was, a uh, 
uh, in, deep in the war machine, and then he, they wanted him to be part of a, a fascist coup mm-hmm. in the United States, which, or sorry, more overtly fascist coup. A fascist coup had already occurred, but um, then he came, and then he spoke, you know, spoke out and walked away from it, right? So it's also possible that people get in deep for, to these situations and and don't realize what they've gotten true. themselves yeah, into that's true and they're yeah. sort of naive and patriotic you know and get suckered into things that right so um, and, and that's that's kind know, of that's what i was getting principle. and that's what i was trying to get to before without like so maybe he could have thought that what he was doing for his country like would have been you know the right thing right like i've seen that i've seen that portrayed in tv shows too back when i'd watch like the crime shows like yeah, i was doing this for my country even though it was like a really terrible thing so like i guess maybe like, yeah that i guess that's what i was trying to get to earlier like, maybe he could have thought that was the right thing and young dumb and naive back in you know early 20s right you never know right right i guess i so let's say we accept all of that as as fact and i i don't know but let's right. say it's yeah. uh, fact up until after the oswald shooting what does the cia the question is what was he and robert anton wilson continuously cia after that point and if so what does the cia have to gain by having those two putting out anarchist writings like they were like that's can't I can't see that being a benefit for the CIA. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't. I just don't understand what they have to gain by that. You know, like I, I don't put anything past anyone, but when things don't really align with the, their self interest, it makes me go like, well, like I don't understand why this is occurring then, because the, you'd think the CIA would want to people that were putting out more patriotic writings or whatever the thing. You know, like having the innovator out there or, you know, ocean freedom notes or Robert Anton Wilson protesting with the priest movement or, or, or putting out um, a bunch of books about sort of free thinking and that, like, I, I don't see that. Um, I don't see where they stand again. I just, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, that's, that, that's uh yeah, that's a good question. Um, And I'll, 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 I guess Corey said that the, I guess it, it brought in a bunch of weirdos for them to pull. Yeah. I guess for them to pull people from, for like the mans and stuff, which obviously I don't I know if that's, that. I don't know if that's, right. yeah, I don't, that's just, that's, so that's his answer. I guess mine would be, um, it's, it's a good question. It, it kind of, it reminds me of like, uh, um, throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when you had like these these really big, um, like the I guess uh, what would be like the Koch brothers and some of these really big that like these basically like fasc- I guess these big fascists who were funding um, a lot of like inner capitalist or you know like free market stuff um, throughout the 60s, but obviously or, or throughout the, throughout that time, and obviously you can see the 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 motive for that would be, um, I guess um, yeah the I guess pri- I guess privatization is good for you know. Um, you know, it's it's good for good for business and such, right? This especially like the fasc- fascistic type of type of type that's out there today. But as far as for this for this case specifically, um, I'm not. Yeah, that's it's. Uh, I'm not sure. I guess. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It was. I guess maybe it was. It was small, and they were just monitoring it um, predominantly. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, or like you said, um, you know, a magnet to pull people in to just have them all in one place, or so to speak. You know, like. Um, you know, they definitely did this with communist groups. You know, um, I think your uh, court even mentioned it. You know, they, they the fair play for Cuba was like entirely a CIA front. So they would just have the CIA front. So communists would come and sign up and they just, just have all the membership be able to get such. that list of communists. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. So maybe that was something with the the innovator or some of these other organizations that the two of those were involved yeah, if, in. It yeah. Was just if, like, yeah. If Kerry was editor of innovator and had that, that, that newsletter list. Yeah. And that's why, so, so a lot of this, so a lot of that stuff, like if you look back from like a modern perspective on like, on all of the, like how far they went with like privacy and security, it's like, it, it might've been a little like, um, you know, talking about like mail being intercepted and like these things they are probably like just being a little overcautious. Maybe they weren't. Um, maybe, maybe they weren't. Um, so I guess yeah, that's that was kind of a I guess another realization, um, which I'm not I'm not I'm not against being overcautious, but it doesn't seem like it was overcautious at all. Um, like a lot of the stuff that they talked about and a lot of precautions they took, like with their mailing list, because they they offered like an, they offered anonymous and and more anonymous ways to, to subscribe, obviously. Um, but but yeah, this is yeah, good uh, interesting interesting stuff here. Wow, it's a shame if it's true. I'll tell you that. I mean, I I don't really have. Um, 
you know, the only thing I've read by Cor Carrie Thornley is mostly on your site. So I don't have like a huge dog in that fight, but uh, no. I am kind of a fan of Robert Anton Wilson. And it would be a shame if that that was all a CIA front. Um, I will say this, though. So as somebody who went deep in the JFK stuff. Every single author or researcher, every one of them says all the other researchers are idiots and <laughs> I've got it figured out. Just so you know, like that's every single one of them down to the man. And that was like one of the first things uh, your guest, Corey, said. And, and Pretty I'm, much. Yeah. I'm not saying this is him at all, but but uh, that was the first thing he said was like, oh, they're all they're all none of them know what they're talking about. I've got it figured all out. And I'm like, I've heard that one before. You know what I mean? I've heard that one before mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, that's that's nearly every researcher. It's like every JFK book. Oh, all the rest of them are wrong. I have the. I've got it solved and I don't think I don't think there is really solving it I don't think we're gonna really ever know exactly all the moving parts that happened I really don't um, yep. there's there's too much in there's too much info that's not even available to the public how do you have anything solved they have like I forgot how many documents that have never been released you know the government documents you don't know what's in, in there it could have been a whole lot even crazier than or more complicated mm -hmm. than they even know currently. You know what I mean? So there's just, there's not a way to know for certain everything that happened in terms of details. Now it's, I mean, you're an idiot. If you think Oswald did it, I, I will say that, or, or at least if you think he acted alone and did it, you know? So um, it was obviously from, you know, at least from the research I've done, you know, kind of a, a culmination of, various interests who wanted Kennedy gone. So, you know, um, the mafia and the CIA and, um, you know, th certain factions of anti-Castro Cubans. And there's, you know, a, a few more um, people in the State Department that wanted him gone. LBJ, the sort of uh, cowboy, um, the cowboy, the you know, the old Yankee and cowboy war, the, um, the cowboy politicians, the sort of Southern Texas, um, faction, the oil men, um, they wanted him gone. Also, you know, um, there's probably a number of bankers that wanted him gone. So he just had a, um, a, a wide collection of converging factors that wanted him gone of people, of variables that all wanted him gone. And I'm pretty sure they didn't work together in some sort of wide conspiracy, but they started to move almost like a machine, like multiple moving parts trying to take this guy out. And I think um, that's my best, you know, as a broad general overview, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that's what um, happened. And I'm pretty sure that Dulles, I actually think LBJ had less knowledge about what was going on than some people think. Um, some people think he was really like, in on it sort of in on like uh in the inner circles making it happen i think he knew it was coming knew that yeah. it was coming but i don't think he had a, a big hand in it i really don't i think he was just as scared as fucking you know he was probably scared shitless right so i think he i don't think lbj had a huge part in it to be honest but and i do think the bush family had a huge part in it and that's something that um doesn't get talked about enough, but I think Bush was uh, might have even been point man on the operation, uh, Bush Senior. Um, so it, the guy he and he later became head of the CIA, and mm -hmm. his he was obviously a member of the CIA f going back for a long time. Like he had Zapata Oil, which was a CIA front, and I'm pretty sure he was the one running, um, like sort of a point man on the ground. He was running uh, groups of Castro, uh, anti-Castro Cubans, and I think he had contacts in the mob too, and he had contacts with a lot of oil men in Texas. Um, so I, I, I think he had a bigger part than even some other people put on, but I don't know. Um, but the point being is like that's the, my general gist, and the details after that, it's like I don't know, and I, I don't think we will know right. for at least probably not in my lifetime, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, yeah, I definitely know where you're coming from. Um, I, I definitely do. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be finishing this, this, uh, this final book, and I'll probably, you know, conclude there. 
um, at least for for right now, because I I've, like like we like we talked about the, the details don't really matter as much. It's more so like like once you kind of understand, um, and that's been my I I I kind of had came to a conclusion a couple of years ago when I was just I've been kind of I guess getting closer to that point but like the a lot of the 20th century was just bullshit like every all the all of the all the stories we were told were, were not true like it, it's it's uh yeah it's, it's all especially the 20th century so um yeah before that who the who the hell knows but uh um i guess uh it's um, probably always been bullshit yeah you know what i mean like we okay so we think uh well you know at least the 20th century is bullshit that's because like uh we're alive now and you know that's pretty recent history, but honestly, it's probably always been bullshit since <laughs> for like the past nine thousand years. Do you know what I mean? So it's always like, um, yeah. it's always you know money and power working together to gain more money and power, and then they put up whatever narrative or fig leaves or uh, you know story they need to sell it to the plebs, right? So we're just at the this past hundred years or so is that's just the newest manifestation of that and that's right. probably been occurring throughout you know most of uh recent human history anyway since the formation formation of the state so i think this is just how it works this is just how it works like so i run into like um conspiracy theorists that and i do not mean this as a pejorative it's not i just mean people that are interested in conspiracies and I run into them, uh, the people that are not anarchists and who are pretty recently sort of waking up to this stuff, right? And it's very apparent that they just, they don't realize like this is just, this is almost a symptom. This is the nature of the state. Like kings and money men have always colluded and started wars and, and tried to control populations to gain more power for the king and more money for the money men and more money for the king it, and they work back and forth it's always happened since the dawn of fucking time it's always happened it's nothing new this is just the nature of statecraft this is how it actually works you th just think it worked a different way you think it should work a different way or it used to work a different way no it's always the state has always been I mean, I hate to use a, like a, a Marxist concept here, right? But the state has always been the organization that does violence to a population on behalf of a certain class of people. It's always been that. All the rest of the bullshit they teach you in history, um, uh, history class is just a narrative or like a fig leaf that they put around that to make it seem like it's something that it's not. And mm -hmm. so... I try to explain this as, you know, sort of uh, people that have just gotten into conspiracies or maybe still have faith that the the government could be something else. But no, it's just this is this is just w how it works. This is how the sausage is actually made. Now, I know you believe that like before this, you previously believed that like sausage comes from the store. But no, now you've seen you've just seen how the sausage is made. This is how the state works. This is how it's always worked. So what we what we see now is just um like i said the current the current manifestation of it and we as humans who are like alive in the 21st century and who were born in the 20th century we just see that as like oh yeah it was really bad in the 20th century no no that's just like we have more information because it was more recent it's always been that way man it's just that's just the way it that's the way it is these are jfk pick your poison the um you know jekyll island world war whatever uh, all of these, you know, um, the Gulf of Tonkin, you know, um, the psychological operate, these are all just symptoms. And the, the root cause is just a centralization of, of power. And when you cent when power is centralized, those with money and power are always going to collude to gain more money and power. And this is just what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. This is just what we um, this is just what we're talking about is symptoms of that, right? Like, right. it doesn't matter who the Rothschilds are. If there's no, number one, they gained their power from statecraft, but there is no armies to buy the, for the Rothschilds to buy or get to fight one another if there is no state, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why these people exist. And that's why these things happen. So there's, it's just symptoms, right? 
So well sorry, rant over, but that's just uh, something I've I've been trying to get through the head of like um, certain um, you know friends of mine, but can, you know uh, more conspiratorial minded, and I I so am I. I'm just not bad mouthing them, but. I'm just I, I I try to get them to understand like you're kind of putting the cart before the horse, right? Like you're not a, these all these things that you're you're obsessed with are symptoms rather than the the root cause, right? And I, so that's just been uh, uh <laughs> that's been uh, something uh, I've been ranting about recently. But mm-hmm. sorry, go ahead. No, that's no, that's okay, man. That's that's well said. That's uh, that's definitely well said. That was my. Um, my kind of conclusion, like I, I started with Bill Cooper and going in secret societies. And, um, when I, you know, found anarchism or I ca- when I came to anarchism, it was more so like, um, I kind of stopped looking into that stuff and, and switched solutions because like, again, as you said, like if there are no centralized power structures to infiltrate or, you know, to take over, then like, it doesn't really matter what these, you know, secret sides are doing. Right. Um, as long as, you know, like it, it's, 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 it's less of an issue at that point. Um, a lot less of an issue if they don't have the centralized power structures to infiltrate and, and subvert. So, um, yeah, you make, you, you make a really, really good point, really good point. So, um, but we haven't gone for about an hour and 40 minutes and, um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, I guess, uh, any other, uh, any other closing thoughts, um, before I, uh, before I close this one out? I'm trying really hard to not go into a rant about secret society, but, um, no, I, I, <laughs> Because I don't have another forty minutes, but um, next time. No, I, I, I don't think. Yeah, no, that'll be next time. Um, no, just um, I don't. I don't have any real closing thoughts. Um, check out the Agora, Agora the podcast. Um, if you like anything I've said here, um, you will also enjoy Agora the podcast. Um, and um, yeah, come help out uh, Gorilla Garden and and piss some cops off, and it'll be fun, and we'll create more food. Uh, other than that, um, you can find me <laughs> at, at Sekmagora everywhere, and um, and um, that's about it. I, I don't know. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, uh, um, thanks a lot for for coming on, man. It's always a pleasure. And um, yeah, look forward to more collaborations in the future and and more uh, more time in the physical uh, physical space and time. So um, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was great, and uh, everybody be excellent to each other. Yes, for sure, for sure. So, all right, guys, there you have it. Uh, Sek Magora from the Agora podcast. Um, yeah, you'll certainly hear from him again soon. But uh, until then, yeah, it's always uh, always great to have him on. Um, so, yeah, make sure to check out VanuPodcast.com for all things Vanu, uh, especially the Handful or So podcast. I just released over the past week or so, and I'm not done yet. Um, also, make sure to check out Elio Publications. Uh, we have Liberty Oriented Books, uh, Strategy Guides, uh, Anarchist Agora's Fiction, uh, Privacy Tools such as Ghost Pads and Ghost Phones, uh, Auras Apothecary, and more to come. Uh, just, just visit libertyintertech.com to view our entire catalog. And uh, on that note, I think we're about topped out on current author clients. So if you're really interested in services like that, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, but uh, no, we do have a lot going on. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, finally, please check out uh, Paznia.com to learn uh, all about the Free Republic of Paznia, um, the Second Realm Network uh, currently under construction. Uh, there's lots happening, uh, many important networking connections, uh, lots of freedom events, uh, the highest quality food, nutrition, and uh, health wellness center, and uh, a coming second round map directory, which we talked about uh, a little bit uh, this evening, and uh, so much more. Again, the website is paznia.com. Uh, so thanks so much for your time today. Uh, always remember, Vaughn was yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis- distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective, and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're 
basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point. If you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story, find your freedom, 